May I introduce the final session of the first day of our conference hosted by the Slovenian Pavilion alongside MCH Global and the Future Blockchain Summit. It is an unbelievable joy to have my close friends Christina from Cointelegraph and the great legend David Chaum, who I met just a year ago now at the Milken Institute where great minds meet. And since then we co-founded AstroCool together a mission to block out the sun to save the world from climate change, which Absolutely. we'll be discussing about, we'll be discussing here today. But more importantly, better than money. And there is nothing better than money, so it is also a little bit unrealistic. <laughs> but you have to set your sights high, and that's what David does. He's proven the impossible many times in the decades past, and it's such a joy to have Christina explore the journey that David has traveled over the decades and his journey ahead. Take it away, Christina. Thank you so much, Oscar. Thank you so much. I'm really honored and pleased to be here today um, to moderate this talk with a, with a legendary inventor, computer scientist, cryptographer, uh, father of uh, online anonymity and godfather of uh, Cryptocurrency. cryptocurrency. I won't yeah. ask you who is the mother. Uh, <laughs> uh, you were also the one who, in '82, right, wrote your dissertation that is basically the precursor of the blockchain paper, white paper. Yes, everything is in fact in in there in blockchain except uh, proof of work. And we'll be talking to the, today about better than money. Uh, I think it's still questionable whether there is anything better than money. I think there are a lot of things that are better than money, but Let's, let's maybe start with uh, this criticism and what, what was your journey to understand that money is not perfect and when um, you started thinking about this actively in the sense that you wanted to change it. Yeah, well thanks. You know, I mean, I've, I've been working on electronic money for 40 years really, uh, what I invented uh, eCash and we built it, I've been in the 80s, early 80s, we built it in the mid 90s and deployed it uh, and more recently uh, this, you know, the BIS, Swiss National Bank, uh, they had the uh, Turbulon project which we, just the report just came out a few days ago, uh, showed that it could do the all Swiss uh, payments uh, three times over and and so forth. So I've been involved in this. You know, I spoke at the uh, Central Bank Secret Conference once. They told me I was the first non-banker they ever invited. And then we walked across several avenues into the, uh, um, you know, into the Sistine Chapel, basically, which was closed off for us. You know, I've been to the, you know, I've sat in the boardrooms at Visa and Citibank and you know, a bunch of central banks around the world and everything. And so it's been quite a wild uh, uh, ride and exposure to all kinds of things related to this industry. But I must admit, I've never uh, really realized how important money is to the global uh, poor and to the inequity, which is kind of really destroying the planet, I think, creating this polar it's feeding a lot of uh, you know, fragmentation and polarization. So it, to, to answer your question, it really, it wasn't until uh, this, in the past year, I found myself uh, in a basically hotel room uh, for a few days because of travel arrangements. And I, and I was, had an upcoming uh, panel on privacy in CBDC or something and I, I just started really reading about all the issues related to payment systems and watching all these, you know, presentations that have been made. And after a few days of this, it just, you know, it, we say light dawns on marble head. It's an expression in, in English that means, you know, uh, it's unbelievable that I hadn't really realized it before, but it just, it just had this like epiphany. It just really hit me that, that Something was is, was really needed in order to help the global poor, and uh, money just needed to be uh, significantly improved. And uh, so, being uh, as I sometimes you know 
a remark, sort of a mission-oriented agent. You know, I like to have a mission and do things, so I just took it upon myself to try to see if I could find something that was better than money for the global poor, but would still be a, a medium of exchange that would be universal and, and uh, allow them to do what they need to do, and it took some real effort. I think it's extremely important to talk about poverty um, also in the frame of COP. Uh, it's not by a chance that the no poverty uh, sustainable development goal is number one uh, among the uh, UN sustainability goals. Um, do you think that the poverty is more um, a social, a political, or a technology problem? Well, you know, until this past year, I, I, I wouldn't have chosen a technology problem, but when you look at, you know, I think I'm the only person on the planet who thinks money is evil now. It is only in the last year. No, you're not alone. Okay. <laughs> I realized it, it, you know, this is the, th this is what keeps the global poor poor, because money is not the kind of thing you want to hold because you're not a, you know, you're not accruing value, you're, you're, it's a kind of what I call, you know, like money slavery, basically. You're, you're, you're subject to, uh, you're not investing, and then you're subject to inflation and, and a possible collapse of currencies and so forth and so on. So it's, you know, what I could say is that, that uh, historically, really you have two kinds of situations that people are in the public. One is there, you know, they feel like they're gaining prosperity, and there's the other kind of situation where they feel like they're uh, not able to reach the kind of level of prosperity of their families, their parents, their the expectations they had. They feel like they're uh, suffering uh, a loss of prosperity, and if you look at what those people do, it's it's very different. The one group defends democracy and, you know, and the, the free market and so on and so forth and very vigorously and without hesitation, look at the last century. And then the other group, you know, look at like uh, Italy in the 30s or, you know, I don't want to get into all that, you know, this gets very, very uh, evil. And when people feel that there's no you know, the system's not working for them. It's not working efficiently. They don't feel a, 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 the a, a gain in prosperity for themselves. Then they just give up power to the nearest, you know, entity that seems, you know, wanting, willing to take it and uh, ho holds out some potential hope. Weirdly, it's a rational economic uh, behavior, I think. I never really thought of it that way. So. I think that the technology, uh, if the technology for money could really allow people to feel like they're, they're building prosperity for themselves and where they genuinely would be, then it's a technology problem. You know, I mean, if you say technology, you know, people obviously discount uh, tech fixes. It's not a very, uh, you know, uh, popular, it's, technology is maligned in, the, in its social impact in that, by, with that with that phrase, but it, but in this case, it's not, it's not really the technology. It is, it's, it's the financial arrangements, and those have been largely limited by the technological uh, possibilities. You know, it, it, the kind of better than money technology cannot be implemented with a printing press or, you know, uh, uh, coin stamping machines or paper files and so on. It takes some very uh, sophisticated mechanism to do it, but now with those mechanisms available, you know, they cost less than a thousandth of what the public is paying for payments. You know, don't forget, we're paying two and a half trillion dollars a year for payments. And the computers that would be needed to implement better than money would cost like a thousandth of that. So it's a two it's a two percent tax on the global economy that is super aggressive, right? The poorer you are, the higher percentage you pay. And if you're, you know, relatively well to do, you pay a negative amount. For your Amex, you get one percent back, right? So 
Yeah. So basically, poverty is a social and political issue that can be solved with the help of technology. I guess, or yeah. But it, it really, the technology is unlocking a new kind of financial system that wasn't technically feasible before. So it's not, you know, it's not like really like a new technology so much, but it, it, it is, it is, I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, let's you delve into it. it. So what is better than money? <laughs> well, that's, you know, okay, there's a little bit of puffery in that name, but I've, I didn't choose it, but many people encourage BTM. me to use it. Yeah. Almost BTC, but BTM. Yeah, it's very close. And it, you know, so it's simply the idea that you can pay someone by transferring value from your portfolio of assets directly into their portfolio of assets. And that uh, means it's not, the, the value is not traveling through money, but it's totally, I could say, interfungible. It, 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 it's, a, it's a universal media of exchange, and so everyone gets to hold all their value in a, an asset portfolio to curate it, if you will. They can get the help of AI in curating it, which, of course, can make it be managed better than banks and others have managed your value for you in the past. So it's very uh, exciting, and then, of course, we're dealing with the you know global uh, liquidity crisis, which you know everyone is in the know realizes this could happen, you know any day now. We are our the financial system, it's not really the technology, but the system is so vulnerable now because of social media technology that it could happen at any moment that that we'd be put into a very uh, bad uh, global financial situation and. You know, it, this affects the poor disproportionately. Again, I mean, the very rich could care less, right? They, they get an opportunity to take a few years off and then come back and buy everything up cheap. But the global poor, you know, this is a life death thing and it's a very serious uh, issue. So holding assets rather than someone else's debt who's sort of ham-handedly in a uniform way trying to one size fits all make money off you, it's just so much more attractive. It's just, a, it's, a, it, it, it's really uh, kind of a no brainer. And if you, if you look a little deeper, you know, when you want to do any kind of future payment, then doing it with a mutually agreed portfolio is so much better and it's, will lead to so much more economic prosperity. So decentralized ledger, blockchain, cryptocurrencies have, have made this step. The, the, the aim was to uh, decentralize, democratize uh, access to, uh, to investments mm. um, and as a consequence, obviously, redistribute wealth in the world. So how bigger is the step uh, from the current cryptocurrencies to this better than money? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's in the sense of infrastructure, in the sense of uh, mainstreamization, in the sense of technology involved, etc. Okay, well, uh, it, you know, that's a very perceptive question, and I'd like to say just briefly as a preface that you know I've always been about decentralization back from when I was a you know grad school at, at Berkeley. So that's decentralization of power has been my mission for 40 years. And you can see that in my work. And the uh, situation we find ourselves in now with all the good work that's been done in you know, our blockchain industry, I feel really a part of it, of course, is I founded the XX Network. And uh, you know, I, 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 I mean, I, I love the blockchain space because it's, it's a place where most Many people really believe strongly in the ethos, and, and it's so inspiring to be uh, a part of it, even though it's, you know, of course, maligned by some other media, you know, mainstream media from time to time when they find that uh, expedient. But the, so the truth is that better than money is just actually a slight incremental step above what the uh, fintech world has been building has been aiming to build. And it's not all you know, that public, but there are actors that have been just trying to tokenize everything. There's a vision for that. There's a lot more happening in that 
uh, space than you, do, than you see. And the tokenization of these assets, that's, I don't know, three quarters of better than money. The, the final part is a, is, a, is a way to create the, this interfungible immediate finality uh, in, in, in value transfer. And that took a little bit of, you know, it's some real uh, uh, fancy plumbing. And an ironic, th there's a couple of ironies. One is that the, the structure actually, in order to work well, mo sort of models or, you know, it, it imitates to a large extent the uh, fractional reserve banking. So even though it's, you might think it's all radically new, it's, it's just kind of, basically a kind of fractional reserve banking where the commercial bank uh, assets are, are the various, uh, you know, uh, commo uh, asset or commodities in the system, and there's a so-called supracurrency, which is what the, the central bank issues uh, that, that makes the uh, sort of real-time finality uh, extremely scalable. I'm sorry if that's a little, you know, technical, but that, that's one way to look at it. So, yeah, it's, it's been a long time in the making, and now we're, we, we're, we're poised to really be able to just move to this, and it, 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 it kind of changes everything, in my view. But do you think that the, <coughs> the society, the community, the infrastructure is ready? Uh, why I'm asking? Because, well, the, the blockchain is still uh, known to very few. Um, it's not yet mainstream. Uh, the, the market cap is counted yet in billions, not in trillions. Yeah. Um, so do you think that it's the right moment to make this step or we should st first work on the mainstreamization of blockchain uh, and then make this step? Well, so it's a, it's a funny situation, but you know, central banks around the world have uh, admitted publicly that, you know, they've been interested in CBDC it really in part, maybe in, in large part, to push back against the you know, sort of blockchain encroachment on their turf. And, and, that, and that explains, of course, why they haven't really gone full out and implemented them, but they're doing a lot of experiments and so forth. And this is by their own admission. I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, to criticize, but, but the the thing is that, uh, you know, I was a little bit worried that so-called central bank digital currencies would be forced on the public in a way where they didn't provide privacy. And this is a great fear of the public. And there are, you know, movements in many developed countries. Do you think it's a fear it. of the public or just of the few who actually think about privacy like in, in my opinion especially after covid like the the privacy value has has diminished for for the mainstream community well that's a really super interesting and complex issue in and of itself but i think if you you know it doesn't take that many people to be a vo vocal advocates for privacy so when the european central bank famously had a public comment period on the you know a few years ago when they said we're going to issue cbdc it's, it's, it's often repeated that 40% of the comments they got were about privacy. And um, so now the Bank for National Settlement has put out this uh, Turbulon report with my eCash 2.0 as its uh, centerpiece. And if you read the report, it's all about privacy because I think that reflects that central banks around the world, you know, I mean, I, okay. I don't want to criticize any particular, you know, uh, governments or portion of the world, but somehow it is a bit of a dividing line, but whether the, the CBDC kind of could spy on people and could disenfranchise people, or whether these CBDCs to be are structured in a way where the individual has control over their own privacy and their own money cannot be taken from them. And so this is, so what I did was I developed a CBDC that had as stronger in 
security and integrity against counterfeiting than any known system. And that is, it's secure even against an adversary, a counterfeiter with infinite computing power. So that's way stronger than quantum resistance. You know, quantum resistance probably is a kind of a scam. If you look at the governments are always saying, you know, you should use our crypto, and later it turns out that they know how to break it. And it goes, this repeated over and over again since the Second World War, and not quite a number of times. Um, so, uh, so I, basically I was trying to take away the argument that we need to spy on you or have, you know, you can't have privacy in the CBDC because we need a higher level of security. So I actually leapfrogged, gave the super high level of security, which I'd actually invented 20 or 30 years ago, this so-called fail-stop signatures, um, with a very strong uh, full anonymity set privacy now. This is incredible and, in my opinion, very important, yes, because I think in the common understanding, security and privacy are not going along. Right. Uh, and privacy is maybe a, a privilege either of rich or of criminals, right? Um, yeah. So I would love to delve a little bit more uh, into the privacy issue. Uh, just um, a small anecdote. So when um, we had manifestations of anti-vax in Italy, in the city I live in, uh, near Venice, Padova, I was incredibly shocked to see that the same people who were in the anti-vax column, they were against digital payments. So, because they were saying that, like in the same narrative, that any digital payment is actually controlling your personal privacy, uh, identity, etc. And this is why for them it was in this, within the same narrative as a uh, vaccine. Uh, so, what is your take on privacy? Why you think it is that important, especially when we are building this sustainable, accessible, uh, equally distributed wealth uh, uh, within the world? Well, let me, let me try to address what you saw in Padua. You know, uh, and it's a wonderful part of the world to visit, um, although a little risky if you don't know how to drive there. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, in any event, um, you know, this is a phenomena that we see these days because of polarization. And I can trace polarization back to a lack of income and wealth equality. I think that contributes to the social fragmentation. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's. Uh, something that we could do something about. But what you see, you know, in these kind of settings over and over again is that the public tars something with a very broad brush. Uh, and it's not, it's not, you know, carefully articulated enough to really do justice to their own benefit, you know, to the, the reality of the situation. So it's a kind of, you know, we say sort of knee-jerk reaction. It's an, over, an overreaction against a whole thing as opposed to an issue. And I, th I think the kind of uh, electronic payments of, of uh, eCash 2.0, which is the, what the, the, the Swiss Central Bank is, is, is developed now with IBM's help, and we demonstrated it, you know, uh, and everything, um, that's, uh, that's something that um, really is, is, is superior to paper money. And let me just dwell on that for one minute. The public, you know, they're very simplistic in their, that's fine because they won't get riled up and do things, that's good. But in fact, you know, if you look online, you can read about banknote uh, dispensers, you know, ATM machines in China. Their standard requires that the, that they, that the equipment knows exactly which serial numbers it gives to each person. And it's also true about the tellers. Now you might think, okay, that's a little extreme, you know, uh, but actually, if then you start to read about how these, you know, who makes the banknote counting equipment, this company in Germany, and this, that, and the other, and well, it turns out that probably most ATM machines globally 
could be used in that way too, because they load the cassettes with a fixed number of notes and every, the counting devices photograph every note and it's all known. So you might, you know, so, some, so the public thinks, oh, paper money, you know, they also forget that their fingerprints are on paper money uh, and they can be developed and then allowed to uh, dissipate with uh, just by heating up some um, uh, crystals to make a little bit of a, a colored gas. So it's, it's a false notion. And, you know, of course, you can't use paper money to buy things online. And, a lot, you know, most things are, a lot of things are being bought online. So it's like, it's, you know, it's a simplistic uh, analysis. And uh, it's, it's based on a lot of, uh, so, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, it's, it, privacy isn't what the general public thinks it is, but it, it, the, their instinct that it is fundamentally important for individual, you know, autonomy and identity and sovereignty, which are essential ingredients for any kind of distribution of power and if we look back at history without a sort of decentralization of power, you know, a lot of bad things happen. And so now, as, and I'll just, in this environment of AI emerging, I mean, these issues are transformed into actually the most central and important issues facing us because, you know, if you don't have privacy in an AI world, then you're just kind of like gonna just give all control over your life to, to AIs. It's only, you know, Elon Musk said recently, uh, you know, AI could do any job that any that people, that people have ever had, you know. But it's not true. There is one job that AI cannot do, and that is represent humanity, vote. You know, we need to protect our humanity by voting and controlling AI and harnessing AI to make the world a better place for people. Otherwise, you know, AI is gonna make the, better, the place better for AI and that's not good for the history of civilization. You mentioned a very important thing, I think. Simplistic understanding is sometimes um, the biggest damage that we have with good technologies and good ideas. So it, we were talking about poverty. In my opinion, the, the problem is not even like not, not only poverty per se, but also the, the cultural um, shift toward greed and uh, that is being um, fed by social media, by um, a lot of other cultural uh, representations. We were discussing yesterday with the, uh, our common friend from yes. Singapore that uh, there are some places in the world, um, Singapore is not one of those, but where y you have to demonstrate that you're uh, wealthy, right? So it's, oh, yes. you are always pushed to demonstrate this. Money is not only a resource and a, a tool, it's actually a, sort of a reputation um, yeah, well, there, there are cultures that are sort of, let's say, uh, monotheistic in their, you know, we say figure of merit. That's an engineering term. You know, I don't want to talk about any specific cultures, but I think we know what we're talking about here. And yeah, that's fine, because if you take away any kind of individual uh, autonomy and, you know, and control over your destiny, then all you really have left is a kind of a game and a simple metric like that uh, you know, uh, can, can really take over. So I wouldn't see this as the, you know, uh, some kind of independent trend that's, you know, uh, bodes poorly for the, uh, for, for civilization. I think it's a consequence of the lack of providing control autonomy, you know, user-enforced privacy, if, if I could, you know, talk my own book, uh, so to speak, uh, you know, th that's, that's, when you, you take that away, you know, sometimes people say, you have nothing. I'm not going to say you have nothing, but you have no 
uh, inertia for civilization uh, to keep going. You have, you're at a very, very, uh, you know, fragile uh, stasis that, that could vaporize at any moment because it's, it's, there's nothing else behind it. So more in detail, how do you see the, the, the better than money system oh. can contribute to this elimination of greed as a, a very perverse concept in my opinion <laughs> that is totally human, right? Like animals do not well. have greed. Um, or do you think that there is such an ambition, at least do you have such an ambition with better than money to eliminate this uh, perversities? Well, I mean, yes, I think better than money can naturally lead to a slightly more uh, decentralized power and so a richer set of uh, things that individuals can aspire to and distinguish themselves with respect to. Uh, if you look at the Athenian democracy, you know, which was uh, for where our Western civilization came from, I mean, that's you know, that was a, a large part of it was your responsibility to participate uh, in the governance and in society. And um, I think that, you know, we, you know, we say the glass is half empty or half full, right? I mean, it, it, you, you could say that this climate crisis, if there were to be, and I think there is, but that's another, that's another chance to speak with you. Um, if there were to be a way to uh, really s bring the earth back to pre-industrial temperatures without damaging anything uh, and not, you know, at $10 trillion a year, uh, as McKinsey says, um, much, you know, then, and the public were to rise up in a certain way without having to really uh, step forward, but just by sort of voting that they really wanted this to be instituted, this would change the, 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 the color of civilization today. It would, it would break the acrimony and the polarization and people would be pulling together to save the planet. So just, you know, this is a perfect opportunity. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in another sphere, I've written about this a little bit, and but it's, uh, you know, the, the precondition for that kind of a thing is privacy. If you, if you, if you, everything about you is transparent, you, you really can't sort of rise up, you know. The, you know, it used to be in the history of civilization that people thought, well, it's a pendulum, you know, we'll, we'll revolt, we'll try this government, if that doesn't work, you know, then there'll be another revolt, we'll have another one, you know, and, and that's the way it's gone, but that game is very definitely completely over. We, make no mistake, we are in endgame for civilization right now, and AI will be used by tyrants to ensure that they will remain in power, and their descendants or whatever, you know, forever, and it's, you know, we start losing countries or, you know, societies to this, kind of thing because people are throwing in the towel, the, the system's not working for them, it's over. That's the end of civilization. You don't get a second bite at the apple. Can you imagine, you know, some kind of AI robots running around, you, you, you know, ordinary citizens are going to, you, know, you can't talk an AI robot into joining your movement like you used to be able to do with the, you know, with the riot police or whatever, you know, there was a hope for this. So you, you know, it's, you know, what, what do they say? Resistance is futile. Yeah, in you know, if 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 the AI knows everything about you, you know, it, it's over. I mean, this is, yeah. So uh, we we really have to um, uh, think of the world as being in a very precarious. You know, we have the liquidity crisis. We have this, this the giving over of control to AI. We have the global warming. We've got a number of of issues, and if we can you know, we could do a kind of jujitsu move on that, take that energy, turn it around uh, with better than money and maybe a little bit of, you know, astro cooling or whatever and, 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 and use that energy to make a, uh, uh, emerge with a great civilization 
uh, that's, you know, you know, I think that this planet is a wonderful, wonderful place to live. I cannot imagine making something on Mars that would be more beautiful and more fun to live in. You know, honestly, please, people, let's, let's be real. You know, we've got to save this planet and our civilization and all the cultural things that we've developed and the diversity of the, you know, the animals and don't pay any attention to people who say, oh, we're going to, you know, we've got to leave here because maybe we'll be wiped. No, let's fix the place up and let's not let the robots take over. Let's make sure this is a human-centered uh, civilization and we can do it right now with, we got the privacy technology for it and that's the kind of the thin edge of the wedge, as we say. That's the way in and now is the time. I like very much this optimism coming from pessimism. I think this is the way we, we should use this energy. Uh, and money is just a tool. And better than money is just a tool. Um, I think it was uh, Jonathan Swift who once said that um, a wise man should keep money in their head, not in their heart. <laughs> so I would say that uh, better than money as well is a tool, right? It's something Absolutely. that is uh, an intellectual power. Uh, and then we should keep the happiness and equality and inclusion That's in our hearts. That's the meaning hearts. of life. And then, you know, this, the, yeah, the, but we got to be just a little bit careful that, you know, it, it doesn't, the, the plumbing doesn't get away from us and, and take over. You know, it's got to, it's got to serve us. I think it's a great note to end this conversation and we can keep with questions uh, in a Q&A angle, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> I, I feel like there's a good, good, good rap on everything, but uh, I'm happy to speak off, 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 offline about, you know, uh, 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 please look at some of my stuff and if you want to... Oh know, yes, please. David not only is a great mind, but he's actually a great writer as well, so... Well, uh, I've got some, you know, if you reach out to me, I might be able to turn you on to some new stuff that's not yet widely distributed and uh, so there's a lot of interesting... So, but let's, let's, let's stay in touch and uh, it was... Uh, thanks for... It's kind of... We started half an hour, 40 minutes late, and I think it's late in the evening. And, uh, but this was, a, uh, thank you everyone for being here. It's just so great. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, David.